Let us pray. Father, we would hear you. Our heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what we could not own, the awesome pass and gift of righteousness. Through Jesus our Lord, open our hearts to receive that today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many. Um, we were a slightly smaller gathering last week as most of you who joined the church became came away. Um, but today is the third in our series where we look at the last quarter of the book of Genesis, which focuses mainly on the life of Joseph, who was one of the twelve sons of Jacob, who we remember was the grandson of Abraham. Now, after the nations of earth were dispersed after the destruction of the town of Babel, God had brought Abraham out of his land. And he promised that he would be Abraham's God, and that Abraham would receive great blessing, that he'd be made a great nation, that all nations would be blessed through Abraham's descendants, and that God would give them all the land that Abraham could see at the time. And at the beginning of chapter 37, which we looked at when we were last in this building with Alan Strange two weeks ago, we can see that those prophecies were starting to be fulfilled. Jacob and his family had settled in the land, whereas Abraham had just been sojourners. And Jacob has 12 sons, which is a large family who might in turn be expected to have many children of their own. But as we saw last week, soon one sixth of those sons had disappeared. Joseph has been sold off as a slave to a group of passing merchants, and Judah has left the others and thrown in his lot with the local pagans. So things aren't going particularly well at the time. And last week, we tried to answer the question of why this story of narrative is interrupted by the rather grim story of Judah in chapter 38. And one aspect of the answer, which is in line with the tradition of Jewish understanding of the scripture, is that that chapter is there to provide a contrast between Judah and Joseph. The contrast shows what might have been had God, God not intervened in individuals' lives to ensure that his promises were fulfilled. And what did happen when God actually does show up and intervene? And it's an important point because we noted that throughout the history of God's people in the centuries that followed, the two most important tribes amongst the children of Israel, the children of Israel, which is the most common term used to describe the Hebrew people in the Jewish scriptures, a Judah and Ephraim. And Ephraim was one of the two sons of Joseph included amongst the tribes, because Joseph got a double share, as the birthright which should have been given to the first son was given to him. And we read about this in 1 Chronicles 5. But back to chapter 39. Um, we saw how the 17 year old Joseph had arrived in Egypt and been sold to Potiphar. Now we learn that Potiphar was in the service of Pharaoh. And held an office of some importance, which is described as being the captain of the guard. So Joseph begins his new phase of his life, and we see in verse 2 the key phrase that we should bear in mind when we look at the whole of Joseph's life. It begins, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, but I wonder how much Joseph was aware of this, or how much comfort it was to him at this time. It would be really easy for Joseph to wallow in self-pity, to feel sorry for himself, and to get bitter and resentful. He'd been his father's favourite son. He would have been accustomed to strutting around as the lord of the manor. And then what happens? His brothers turned against him. They strip his favourite robe of him, the robe that his father had given him as a mark of his special status. And then they throw him in a pit and leave him, only to return a while later, not to put him out to say it's all been a joke and to restore him to the family. No, they sell him off to passing merchants. 
And then he's marched off down to Egypt, a totally alien country. He might not know the language, but they don't know. And he's put up for sale. And then after that, he's marched off to the house of someone who's clearly something of a hard case. We don't really know much about Potiphar, but he's clearly someone who's more than happy to delegate. He's also someone who wouldn't have suffered fools gladly. As captain of the guard, he would have had an air of authority and been accustomed to being obeyed by a group of soldiers and armed men. He would not have been someone who would have been taken in by a display of what we might call upper class Antonian charm or smoothness or superiority that can seem to work in certain circles today. He would not have suffered fools lightly. And yet, after a while watching Joseph, Something clearly does impress him. Potiphar would have seen what Joseph did and how what Joseph does is met with success. The Bible's in no doubt about what's happened. Verse 3 says, His master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with Joseph and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Potiphar is no mark and he sees where his own best interests lie. So he puts Joseph in charge of his own affairs. It's a bit like what happens in the short shot of Danger when Tim Robbins' character is put in charge of managing all the finance of the activities for the prison, prison government. That uh, doesn't work out too well for him in the end. Things continue to go well, uh, so much so that Potter puts Joseph in charge of everything that he has. And from that time we read, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house with Joseph's seed. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had. And this concludes the first part of this chapter. Potiphar has delegated everything to Joseph, so now his only concern is what's on the menu and what's on the wine list. The Lord is blessing him because of Joseph. And what of Joseph at this time? Is he aware of God's blessing on him? Is he growing up? Now he's no longer the little princely, lording it over all his brothers that we saw at the start of the story. And I think the next part gives us a bit of a clue to answer that. From verse 6 onwards, we see that Potiphar is the only one in the household who's noticed something special about Joseph. Although in this case, it's probably not Joseph's financial acumen that catches the eye. We read, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a while, Potiphar's wife cast her eye on this young, attractive slave. This isn't a one-off passing event. She is persistent in his pursuit of She probably wasn't used to not getting her own way. She may even have been in the habit of having her pick up all the bad stones in the house while Potiphar was off playing soldiers. So why would it be any different with Joseph, this new addition to the household, who not only was clearly able and diligent, but also something of a heart? But Joseph clearly thought about the situation and resolved how he would deal with it. His circumstances are a world away from those of Judah that we looked at last week. Judah was his own master, he'd come and go as he pleased. He'd been married, he'd had three sons of his own, and then been widowed, and he heads off up the road with his mate and takes a shine to this woman selling her services by the side of the road. He was free to do what he wanted, and he indulged himself. Joseph, on the other hand, for all the faith that he's now with Potiphar and the authority he has in the house, he's still a slave, subject to summary punishment up to an including death, and there'll be no one to speak up for him in his defence. And now he's being pursued by his master's wife. Joseph's response is simple and firm. He says no to her, and not out of convenience or embarrassment. He doesn't say oh, what happens if we get caught or anything similar. No, he says, oh, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He clearly thought about what might happen and had determined in his heart not to sin, not to give in to temptation, and to be crystal clear about why, what he should do, and why. His whole thinking was framed by awareness of God and what belonging to God should be. And clearly, the 
trajectory of her advances is not a one-off thing, but a firm, resolved, consistent course of action. Joseph takes every measure he can do to stay out of the way. But sure enough, the day comes when she calls him on his own. Here's her chance. No one's around to hear them or to know about her. But Joseph has decided long before what he would do. Now, if I'm honest, I think Joseph is the complete opposite of what I would be like in a similar situation. I remember this poem from my days in college by Steve Turner, a reader. Lead me into temptation just one more time. Lead me up close from circumstances beyond my control. Lead me, then leave me. Deliver me from my escape, increase my ignorance, limit my will, make me the victim of a victimless crime. Lead me till sin is the only way out. Give me a taste of what to avoid. Lead me till it's your fault. Yet flood floods, yet guilt floods me like a chill. Then lead me back into temptation just one more time. But the thing is, we know from what we read in Scripture that there is never a situation where sin is the only way out. 1 Corinthians 10 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And Joseph here proves the truth of that. He runs away, even though it means leaving his clothing behind him. And there are unmistakable echoes of something we read in Mark's Gospel when Jesus is arrested in Gethsemane. There it says, a young man wearing nothing but a living garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment. Sometimes we escape, leaving everything behind. Remember, in chapter 37, Joseph was seized by his jealous brothers and had his cloak, his special garment that his father had given him as a sign of his faith. He had that ripped off him. And now, in order to do what is right, to act as a child of God who's experiencing God's favor, Joseph willingly leaves behind his cloak here. This Joseph is clearly a different Joseph than the bumptious teenager who was son to the passing merchants. So what happens then? Potiphar's wife is not willing to take no for an answer, so she uses her power to cover up her own shamelessness and to get revenge on this upstart slave who spurned her advances. She fabricates a tale, falsely accuses Joseph and brandishes the abandoned cloak with evidence. She complains to her husband, who don't forget, has authority over true divine men. And she spins her whining false tale, blaming not just Joseph, but also her poor husband. She starts off by saying, that Hebrew slave that you brought us. It's not hard to imagine that Potiphar's thinking, oh, I'm going to get it in the neck again. She's going to say, it's all my fault. And so, perhaps, her entire life and a bit of peace, he just accepts her story and has Joseph carted off to prison. But we're also told that Potiphar isn't just acting out to resolve her quiet life or to escape the nagging. No, he sees by anger. And when we make decisions in anger, we don't always make the best decisions. Potiphar didn't stop to think whether what his wife was telling him squared with what he himself had seen in Joseph in his character. Potiphar had clearly been impressed by Joseph and seen how well things were going. And when Joseph was in charge of his and yet he didn't stop to think about any of them, but simply parted him off. And who knows? Perhaps Potiphar's affairs took a nose down once Joseph left, just like happened in the film. Because when Joseph left, God's blessing on the house left with him. So Joseph ends the chapter in the same position that he started, deprived of his liberty, in a new setting, but God was still with him. Indeed, he read that not only did God give him his favour in these terrible circumstances, but also that God showed him chesed. Now, we've looked at this word chesed before. It's an integral part of God's character 
When God passed before Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 34 and describes his character, he uses this word chesed twice to describe himself. It's a term that encompasses mercy and grace. The King James Version made up a word to describe it, loving kindness. It didn't exist before. It denotes unwarranted favour, goodness and blessing. Our Bibles often translate it as love, but they frequently amplify it to show the scope of it, to show that there's more than a single word can convey. Steadfast love, unfailing love, faithful love, merciful love, covenant love, Nearly 250 times in the Hebrew Scriptures we see this word translated. It's not anything that can be earned. Yet God bestows it anyway, freely, generously, wonderfully, ceaselessly. I think it's significant that at the start of the chapter we read that the Lord was with Joseph. And at the end of the chapter, after Joseph has resisted and fled from temptation and sin, not only do we read that the Lord was with Joseph, but also that he showed Joseph Hassan steadfast love. Would Joseph have seen that? Joseph had fled from temptation. He refused to see Potiphar's wife. And yet, as a result, here he was, stuck in a prison where Pharaoh set his prisoners. This was worse than the situation he had previously with Potiphar. And Joseph himself later describes this new place as a dungeon. Yet again, those around Joseph who have no obvious reason to help him or like him, they see something in him. So the prison warden, just like Potiphar, puts Joseph in charge of the day to day affairs there. And he doesn't worry about anything once Joseph's in charge of him. So what is Joseph thinking now? He's clearly not the same uppity teenager who told tales about his own brothers. He must know God. He knows what's right according to God's character. And because of that, he is determined to live in a way that will please God, whatever. This stands in stark contrast with what we saw in Judah and his brothers. Joseph is clearly growing in maturity in knowledge and in understanding of God and God's character. Yet Joseph is stuck in the dungeon, having been falsely accused and framed by a lustful, deceitful, and in particular, put there by a weak, indecisive husband. The challenge for Joseph now is to persevere. He's been faithful to God this far, hasn't allowed bitterness to take hold of him hasn't wallowed in self-pity, but can he continue like this for years and years, keeping himself free from that self-pity and bitterness and resentment that rots the sun inside him? Joseph is ill for the law, but from this chapter we can see that he's decided that the most important thing is to remain faithful to the character of God and trust in that character. I find this incredibly inspiring. While at the same time, I am far from confident that I will make the same decision and see it through whatever happened. But this is a decision that Christians still make today. We pray often for the work of open doors among Christians there. We remember what's happening to our brothers and sisters in places like Hong Kong today, who are under threat for holding dear to the name of Jesus. In our men's group yesterday, we talked about the testimony of Helen Rosevear. Helen Rosevear was a doctor, and when she graduated, she wanted to use her medical skills in service of God. And she said that she wanted to serve Christ no matter where, no matter what, no matter the cost. And in the course of that, she went to the Belgian Congo. And in the 1960s, when the rebellion broke out, she found herself in the middle of the some of her colleagues were shot through the temple right in front of her, their bodies ducked in an open grave which was covered over and then they were marched on. She and other young women were raped and brutalised at the hands of these troops. Yet years later, she talked about various things and the challenges and the struggles 
along with journey in our life. And how it's important for us to allow God to use the hurts in our lives to mold us to be more like Jesus, to draw us closer to Himself. Not to seek, not to seek to avoid the hurts, but to realise that our reactions to them can bring God joy and pleasure as we trust Him even in the darkest dark. And then she said this, the phrase God gave me years ago, during the 1964 rebellion in Congo, in the night of my greatest need was this, can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you more? Can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you more? Can we thank God for trusting us with the most painful experiences, even if he never tells us why? That's a level and depth of faith that I can't begin to comprehend, but I think it speaks to the kind of faith that Joseph knew in his long months and years in prison, abandoned, falsely charged, and seemingly forgotten. Joseph is the contrast with the deceit, selfishness, and self-indulgence we saw in Judah last week. His is a deep living faith that continues to stand firm, even though it would have been so much easier to go with the flow and to please himself and others and not God. This is the character that Peter would describe to Jesus 1500 years later when he writes, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Joseph knew God's favour, and he knew that God was showing him chesed, even though his outward circumstances might lead him to sin, to bitterness, and self pity. No, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Joseph had stripped of his coat of favour by his jealous brothers. Joseph left behind his new clothes that he got a pot of hand to be able to escape from sin. And yet he sought a much better adornment, the robes of righteousness that our Saviour earned for him and for us. Perhaps even now in heaven, Joseph is echoing the words of Isaiah 61. I delight greatly in the Lord, my soul rejoices in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. So let us, like Joseph, determine to resist temptation, to flee from sin, and to continue in God's righteousness to the end, trusting in the Saviour who loves us, who died for us, and who rose from the dead and is sitting on the throne in heaven forever. Let us too receive and rejoice in God's essence his favour and his boundless love that he offers us so freely. Let us be steadfast in living as God's children, 